Hello folks, today we're going to learn something about how proteins are being made from DNA. That is protein synthesis. Of course, we'll be also talking about a genetic code. So with me, we have uh, Dr. Aman, who is going to help us through and through this journey. Well, to begin with, we all know nucleic acids, uh, they could be in form of RNA and DNA. And the DNA contains, uh, we know, uh, some of the biological programs, what we call the genetic code. Well, uh, Aman, could you throw some light before we go forward? As we know, there are two strands of DNA. One of the strands always hold the information for the protein to be synthesized. That strand is referred to as the missense strand. Okay. And the other strand of DNA, which are not going to participate in synthesis mm -hmm. of RNA, mm -hmm. that is referred to as sense strand. So what you mean is the two DNA strands, they separate. One of them acts as a template for the messenger RNA to be formed. Yeah. Well, long back, uh, Archibald Garrett, he suggested that segment of DNA, that is genes, they dictate or they give a phenotype uh, through a set of enzymes and thus uh, they help in the process of chemical reactions. Well, Beadle and Tatum, they worked on this uh, uh, fungi called Neurospora and they had mutated this uh, fungi, uh, the bread mold, with x-rays. And one more thing which we should know is what is a minimal medium in which they could grow this mold. Aman. Minimal medium will be that nutrient media provided to the organism to be grown which will be uh, without without any one nutrient. Okay, suppose a fungi uh, or some fungi they need uh, say one to three uh, amino acids. Suppose if, one of them is missing then that medium will be referred to as minimal medium. That means medium, minimum medium, uh, minimal medium does not contain some ingredients. Some ingre ingredients which mm. is required for their growth. Okay. Here is the experiment. Now what did they do? They took four sets of container. One had the minimal medium. The second one had minimal medium with ornithine and amino acid. The third one had citrulline along with minimal medium and the fourth one with a minimal medium and arginine. Now, in these four sets, they could grow what you call this neurospora or the fungi. And one of the fungi which was uh, naturally found, were referred to as wild type, could grow in all the sets. Because the wild type organisms have a capacity to cope up with the deficiency of any of the nutrients because they have the genes where they can synthesize the missing amino acid or the nutrient. And that's what has been seen. Once this wild type was mutated in mutant 1 and mutant 2 and mutant 3, they could see that yes, they could not grow in some medium or other, yeah. uh, some of the media. And hence this experiment. Let us go to the next one and then we will find out what really happened. Actually, why they performed this experiment? Because ornithine amino acid can, in nature, get converted to citrulline and citrulline can get, get converted to arginine. With the help of enzymes that they transfer there or convert Which them. are generally present in the wild varieties, but because they mutated few of the wild by X-rays, they created three mutants. mutants. One yeah. which cannot synthesize ornithine, another which cannot synthesize citrulline, another which cannot synthesize arginine. arginine. All right. That we would see in the following slide. Here we go. Here we see that there happens to be a gene which converts the precursor or the ingredient into a, a, a component called ornithine. And therefore the wild type could do that. And ornithine was converted to citrulline and thereafter to arginine and therefore wild type could grow in all the three or four sets. But in class 1 mutant, 
could not convert the precursor to arnithine and hence could not grow there. The class 2 mutant could not do so uh, like it couldn't convert the ornithine into citrulline because the gene was being mutated and could not produce a particular enzyme and similarly class 3 could not convert citrulline to arginine because it had some mutations and hence the enzyme was missing and therefore arginine was not uh, what do you call uh, being synthesized being synthesized thank you so therefore we know that for every um, what you call uh, enzyme we need a particular gene am i correct that's why this experiment uh, later on led to one gene one enzyme hypothesis yes so you mean to say that one of the enzyme can be manufactured and produced by one set of genes and that's what was more specific in this experiment of Beadle and Tatum. So the researchers uh, continued more, they learned that it is not only an enzyme but even a small polypeptide chain can be produced, they came to that specificity, right? Yeah, like you know the one of the protein may be having few hundred of amino acid or even nine amino acid like there is vasopressin hormone just with nine amino acid but there can be proteins even with 60,000 genes controlling them. So to begin with, with a little briefing let's begin. What is central dogma? Now DNA gives RNA, RNA gives proteins. Now this sequence is referred to as central dogma in the field of genetics. In more elaborated form, we can study like this, that the gene replicates a segment of DNA which is good, going to do the function, would split the two strands and a small segment of RNA will be synthesized over it what we call transcription and this messenger RNA would come out of the nucleus with the help of ribosome it will translate into proteins or form proteins with the help of the two sub units of ribosomes and this central dogma goes topsy-turvy only for few set of the viruses one are the cancer viruses referred to as oncovira and the second one retrovira whose example is HIV. You mean, what do you mean by topsy-turvy? Because Meaning their genetic material is RNA instead of DNA. So they synthesize on their RNA, DNA and then DNA undergoes transcription and translation. Okay. So, so we say it is reverse transcription in their case. Or terminism? Taminism because it was discovered by Tamin and Baltimore. Okay, so naturally it is the DNA which gives rise to RNA, RNA gives rise to proteins. Except two exceptions, oncovira and retrovira. That is, they show Taminism. They show Taminism. Now in prokaryotes, uh, the generalized transcription and translation occur together, almost simultaneously. Because they don't have nucleus, therefore everything is occurring inside the cytoplasm. So there is no question of bifurcation, yeah. nuclear activity and cytoplasmic activity. Yeah. All right. So they occur, this phenomena, almost simultaneously. DNA gives rise to mRNA and that forms, with the help of ribosome, the polypeptide chains, right? and what we call transcription and translation. Whereas in eukaryotes it is a little different. You have the transcription within the nucleus and thereafter the translation process outside the nucleus that is in cytoplasm. Now, protein synthesis occurs in two steps. Transcription, that is formation of various RNA and Translation, that is those RNA, they help in the process of formation of proteins. Here it is. We know 
that a cell always have its own set of DNA by which it makes various photocopies. Let's uh, go forward and uh, we will see how things happen. The RNA transcription, the first process. We see the DNA double strand on the right hand side which gives rise or rather produces a RNA that is a single strand. And how does it do? But before we go forward, we have to understand that the DNA contains thymine and the RNA contains uracil instead of thymine wherever it exists. The first step, the RNA transcription. What really happens in RNA transcription? Well, it is somewhat similar to DNA replication. That is the same enzyme helicase is going to open two strands of DNA. Mm -hmm. Gyrase will stretch the DNA. And then enzyme RNA volumerase is going to bring the respective nucleotide on DNA so as to synthesize RNA. That all, is messenger RNA. All the three kind of RNA are synthesized by different genes of DNA. Here it is. We see on the top a DNA strand on which a mRNA is being formed. Now here one basic important thing to understand is that any kind of RNA, whether it is tRNA, rRNA or messenger RNA, when they are synthesized on the template DNA, they move always from the direction 5 dash to 3 dash. Reason, the RNA polymerase binds only at the 3 dash end of any DNA template strand. So obviously it has to be 5 dash to 3 dash. Obviously the strand which will be synthesized, synthesized. whether tRNA or rRNA or mRNA, it will be in the direction 5 dash to 3 dash. Here we see the RNA polymerase attaching. Uh, On the 3 dash end. Yeah. We talked about it. The first uh, or rather the whole of the process of synthesis of RNA or RNA transcription can be started in three small steps. Initiation, elongation and termination. Now naturally the first step will be that RNA polymerase has to recognize that particular DNA strand where it is going to bind and synthesize its respective RNA. So you mean there is a particular site where... There is a particular site on DNA strand which is called as promoter which attracts the RNA polymerase. Next to promoter is operator where RNA polymerase binds and then it does polymerization of respective RNA molecule. That is called as elongation of RNA. So as the RNA polymerase moves it keeps unfurling the DNA and keeps forming the segment of mRNA. The only difference will be instead of thymidine, it is going to pick up uracil. And thus, the whole uh, 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 I mean, length of what you call the RNA or mRNA would be formed and it will get tipped off. It will be get uh, it, the, it will get terminated mm -hmm. as soon as some respective genes of DNA will come on the DNA which stop the process of transcription. Okay, okay. We will be learning that in details a little while later. Yeah. Here is a RNA polymerase and how it is unfurling the DNA and forming the mRNA over it. And wherever there will be adenine, it is going to attach uracil instead of thymidine. That's the only difference between replication and transcription. Well, uh, mRNA would have a cap and a tail. And these two ends and the initial end and the terminal end, that is a cap and a tail, is very important for a mRNA. Can you tell me why is it so important? In case of prokaryotes, because every process is occurring in the cytoplasm itself, mm -hmm. there is no threat to the RNA formed. 
but in case of eukaryotes because the messenger RNA is being synthesized in the nucleus and it has to move from nucleus to cytoplasm there is a danger that the messenger RNA may lose some essential genes. Oh, that could uh, form a wrong kind of protein. Or it may not form at all. Or it could give rise to mutations. Because there are certain enzymes which will uh, Fragment. cut the messenger RNA if it is a wrong kind of messenger RNA entering the cytoplasm. And hence, a mRNA would have a cap and a tail so as to bind it and keep it intact. Am I that right? is one reason. The second reason is the cap on the 5 dash end is very essential to attract the small unit of ribosome because that attaches on the 5 dash end of messenger RNA. All right. Therefore, the 5 dash end of messenger RNA is processed and guanosine triphosphate molecule is attached on the 5 dash end which is called the cap of messenger RNA and on the 3 dash end repeated nucleotide adenine 2000 to 3000 are added which is called as poly a tail poly A because of adenine. adenine attached to it and there are certain set of also <coughs> I'm sorry certain set of codons or nucleotides which will be chopped from messenger RNA in case of eukaryotes referred to as splicing which we will learn just later on here what is called as RNA splicing or split genes now this is a unique feature which again belongs to eukaryotes uh, Every uh, DNA segment would have uh, some uh, fragments which is not essential and there are certain things which are essential and they are referred by uh, the term intron and exon. Now these introns which are not necessary will be removed. Because introns can never be translated therefore they are spliced off by spliceosome a kind of RNA polymerase enzyme from messenger RNA. So, these removal of introns will lead to a pure form of exons, a series of exons, right? So, the uh, which will be attached by ligase so okay. as to form the complete messenger RNA. This whole process. Now, this complete messenger RNA has on 5 dash a tail of GTP, on 3 dash poly A tail, and in the middle only set of exons. The whole thing is referred to as RNA splicing. Here we are, we have a DNA strand, set of genes, here is a single strand of DNA that is being shown, a mRNA, mRNA segment is formed over it, instead of thymine we would always have uracil. And here see we have gene 1, gene 2, gene 3, gene 1 will be producing its own messenger RNA we can call it mRNA1, gene 2 will be producing mRNA2, gene 3 will be producing yeah. mRNA3 and respectively they will form their own kind of proteins. Okay and here something we see as a codon or a genetic code that is going to be translated. Because every amino acid is represented by the three set of nucleotides Therefore, every code is triplet. Okay. And thus, translation occurs. Every code will give rise to a particular amino acid and they will be sequenced. Now, for the whole process, we require mRNA, transfer RNA and ribosomes. And the whole polypeptide or amino acids, when they are stuck together with the help of bonds, what we call peptide bonds, the whole thing is referred to as a polypeptide chain. Now, each of the nucleotide sequence in an mRNA is referred to as codon, as you said. Yeah, and it is always triplet. Three nucleotides represent one codon. And that for one codon will always give rise to one amino acid. Yeah. So, a codon is really nothing but uh, sequences of nucleotides, three of them together and that forms a codon and every codon would give rise to uh, amino acids. Let's see how they do that. So, three nucleotides together would form one codon. 
Now here we have, because it's a triplet codon, one base will be towards 5 dash n, another base will be towards 3 dash n, what is written as the third position, and then there will be the middle one, middle base also, referred to as the second messenger base. The first base and the second base, they are the fixed bases, okay. they generally don't change. It is the third one which wobbles. Okay. Now, also, as I see here, Aman, we have about 20 amino acids. For every amino acid, therefore, they, we would have always more than one, usually, not necessarily, more than one codons. Except tryptophan and methionine, which have single codon, rest all amino acid can have two to six codon. For example, here, uh, there is a phenylalanine. It is having, in the beginning, triple U. Triple U stands for phenylalanine and UUC also stands for phenylalanine. That means phenylalanine amino acid has hmm. the two codons. Yes. Now in this case, the 5 dash end has U, the middle has U and you can see the third one, 3 dash end is only changing. In the first case, it is U. In the second case, it is 3. But in both the cases, the first and the middle base, they are fixed. Therefore, the base which wobbles or which changes which is always towards the 3 dash end. That means you mean in a codon, the last nucleotide, whether whichever it is at the 3 dash end, would wobble or change. And give rise to more than one codon. Yes, but nevertheless still it will produce the same, same kind of... Same kind of amino acid. That means 61 codons have a meaning out of 64 and 3 are the stop signal which are marked red here, UAA. UAG, UGA, they do not represent any of amino acid as soon as they will come on messenger RNA, whole process of translation will stop immediately. So obviously every sentence has a full stop and it is necessary. And therefore they are referred as stop codons. Now this generic code is universal, whether it is in bacteria or a fungi or an animal or a plant. Because all the amino acids that are present in these organisms are present everywhere. And the great thing, even in the viruses, and that's why viruses attack us. Wow. Let's see something about translation now. How those uh, set of nucleotides, that is mRNA, they are translated into proteins. In general, we have to understand that there are two subunits of ribosomes, large and small, and they have three grooves. In fact, the two ribosomal units are never attached to each other when the cell is not in process of protein synthesis. They are they away come, from each other. Yes, they come together only, only at the time of translation. Okay. First messenger RNA will come from nucleus, and then the smaller subunit it has initiation protein to recognize that messenger RNA. It will come and bind on the 5 dash N. This component together is recognized by transfer RNA, which will come and bind to the smaller subunit at a place which is called the P site of ribosome. Now, we see this uh, RNA which comes at this P site has got two ends. One end you have the amino acid and one end you have because, trans because right? transfer RNA has two specific sites. The site on 3 dash end is amino acyl site where it, it attaches its respective amino acid. On the opposite end, there are three bases which are anti codon. Okay. And this P site is the peptide linkage site, the site where peptide bond will occur. Okay. Then the larger subunit will come and attached to whole of these components, smaller subunit, messenger RNA, attached with it, transfer RNA, carrying its respective amino acid. Now this is a three-dimensional molecule of a transfer RNA. It has the anti-codon site and a amino bind amino acid binding site. So we were talking that there are 61 codons in the genetic code. That means there are 61 One kind of transfer anti, RNA. And also anti because they will be having each transfer RNA 
will be having three bases which are referred as anticodon which are going to form the hydrogen bonding temporarily with the codon of messenger RNA. This is a typical transfer RNA molecule how it looks like. Now what really happens is the enzymatic reactions. Now would you explain this? Well amino acids they are in the pool of the cytoplasm again they are freely present. Mm -hmm. Transfer RNA is also located in the pool of cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. Transfer RNA is never attached to its respective amino acid till messenger RNA is present in the cytoplasm. You mean to say that uh, transfer RNA and amino acids are usually in the cytoplasm free. They will get attached together only in presence of an enzyme and that enzyme happens to be amino acyl transfer RNA synthetase. And this enzyme gets activated once messenger RNA is located in the cytoplasm. Okay. It will help the transfer RNA to bind its respective amino acid, this enzyme amino acyl synthetase. Now this is a, a dimensional or three dimensional structure uh, being shown here of a ribosome but let's go deep to it. Here it is or rather simple form, two units, one heavy and one light subunits. Now these two come together at the time of translation. And another thing important about these two subunit is the smaller subunit helps to recognize messenger RNA therefore start the process of protein synthesis and the larger one it stores the enzyme peptidyl transferase which helps in binding one amino acid to another. And the group is only that much uh, in diameter that it can encloses maximum two codons at a time. So the first mRNA strand binds to the large or the smaller subunits. The smaller subunit. And then the larger one. Yeah. In the cytos in the cytoplasm or cytosol, right? And okay. both the ribosomes have what, three sites. What is that point? Uh, it says AUG initiation codon. What do you mean by this? Well, AUG, it represents the amino acid methionine mm -hmm. and this is the codon where protein synthesis start for every organism. That means for any protein synthesis in any organism, the starting amino acid formed would be always methionine? Exactly. For every enzyme, for every protein, the first amino But let's uh, talk about uh, ribosome a little more. Uh, it has three binding sites for the codon and as I see it, it is E, P and R site, A, A site, I'm sorry. So E is the exit site where the amino acids have been formed and uh, that particular uh, uh, transfer RNA will be uh, going off from that group. And then you have the P site. What is that P site? It is the first uh, Where site? the peptide linkage will occur. Occur. And A would be? Where the new incoming transfer RNA will be accepted. Okay. So one goes out, one Therefore comes Therefore one in. is acceptor site, peptide. Here is the same thing being explained again. Here we see the exit site from where the transfer RNA has been removed without amino acid. And then we see another two kind of transfer RNA. One is a middle one and one is a right side having only one amino acid. Now there is one process which always occur as soon as one, trans one transfer RNA is removed the ribosomal complex it shifts further and the middle transfer RNA will give its chain to the incoming transfer RNA therefore the chain will get attached to the right handed transfer RNA middle will become empty and or it will free be again rather, yeah. and it will go to the exit side and thereafter and again out. it will be thrown off because ribosomal complex keeps on shifting one codon. That was in a nutshell. Now, how does the chain fall in three steps? Initiation, elongation, termination. Again, in the same way. So, as we already discussed, this initiation is done by uh, the messenger RNA which comes to the cytoplasm, it is attracted by the smaller subunit. Mm -hmm. Once these two get attached, the transfer RNA having the first amino acid methionine 
it has anti-codon always UAC it comes and binds, binds temporarily to the, to the codon the codon is AUG okay. that is initiation codon so this process is initiation the ribosomal uh, the bigger unit then comes and attaches and this ribosomal complex then chips further the new transfer RNA will come according to the respective codon of messenger RNA at site A at site A as soon as the ribosome complex will shift further at P site the transfer RNA having its amino acid methionin will now attach that methionin to the incoming transfer RNA amino acid having its amino acid having its amino acid and that's how the Change elongation amino. keep on occurring and this is exactly being shown uh, in sequential form making use of ATP molecules once the ribosomal complex keeps on shifting and it reaches some stop signal those three stop codon we talked about mm -hmm. the chain is immediately terminated okay once you have that stop codon coming in the because chain it stops. does not represent any of amino acid no more transfer RNA will come okay the ch chain of messenger RNA is detached from the ribosome that is what is referred to as termination termination it can be the stop codon UAG, UGA or UGG. Wow. So here is a polyribosome. That is a series of ribosomes which are forming a long chain of, a chain of polypeptide. Because it is the utilization of the messenger RNA on the single messenger RNA. The in the same initiation codon will keep on receiving another ribosome because the previous ribosomal complex has shifted further. So at a time we can synthesize many polypeptides on the same same messenger RNA. Therefore, it is called polyribosome. Okay. So mRNA. There comes the ribosome transfer RNA with its anticodon and amino acid fitted into the groove of ribosome. Another transfer RNA comes in. The amino acids join forming a peptide bond. The free transfer RNA goes off and the whole sequence shifts to the right again and there is an entry at A point and sequence of amino acids are thus formed. We can see it one more time. So here are some of the questions for you. If this is the sequence of DNA strand, what would be its complementary strands? What would be the mRNA strand for this strand of DNA? Obviously, there cannot be thymine. You have always uracil. So. Similarly, there could be another question of this kind where you have the mRNA and what will be the sequence of amino acids for every three nucleotides it would form an amino acid that is every codon would have a specific amino acid would form rather. Now, mutations are nothing but sudden changes that occur in a DNA segment and therefore bringing a uh, different kind of protein synthesis. And if a small uh, base pair of a gene 
is being affected, it is referred to as point mutation. That is a very small segment. Let's see here. We can see here uh, a small segment of base pair being affected and therefore change in the amino acid sequence. So instead of CTT, if we have CAT, obviously the transfer RNA changes and hence from glutamine to valine, uh, a new protein is being, or amino acid is being formed. And this is mutation. Various types, base pair substitution, base pair insertions, it can be deletions, it can be additions. Substitution would be if a base pair is changed with another set as we see sequentially here. Insertion. Sometimes a new nucleotide could be inserted or deleted or removed from and hence giving rise to a different sequence and thus new kind of proteins or amino acids are being formed. Referred to as frame shift mutation. All of a sudden, any mutation occurring during DNA replication or recombination or repair. And any chemical that would produce mutation are referred to as mutagens. Well, we know what is a gene. And that was the summary of transcription translation or rather protein synthesis.